The unique story in Oklahoma sports centers around six American Indian basketball players who played for then Division I Oklahoma City University and their celebrated basketball coach Abe Lemons. Lemons had a gift for finding talent in small Oklahoma communities and he liked to recruit American Indians. He even referred to himself as the greatest American Indian basketball coach. Uh, we came from small towns. He came from Walters, I came from Hollis. And so um, getting kids from Sorrell and Fletcher and Elgin and, and, and so forth, he was proud to have those kids. Uh, they, they had a special quality about them and, and, uh, and he was very proud to, to, uh, to have a strong Native American influence on his team. Uh, I've been around Indian boys all my life, and Indian girls, and it just seems natural. Mm -hmm. But I always liked small town boys. And I, I recruited an Indian any place I could find one to play. Hard nose, they'll toe the line for you, you can count on them in a clutch. Abe always was able to conceal the fact that he was a damn good coach. I, I think he had a great uh, grasp of basketball. I remember talking to him one time. He said, give him the corner shot. Make him take the corner shot. Well, you know, somebody might just pass that remark off. But the most difficult shot in basketball is to shoot from the corner. That sums up all of defensive play. Because if you can force the ball into the corner, then you've put it in a position where the offense can't do a hell of a lot with it. And the things that he said were often very simple but had a tremendous amount of meaning. And, and I think that uh, one time he was asked uh, how many of his players graduated, and he said every one that wanted to. Uh, and, and I thought that was a great comment. Uh, I think sometimes he was never given enough credit for being an outstanding basketball coach. Uh, because of this humor, he was always joking around, and, and people oftentimes took him for not being serious about uh, coaching, but he certainly was. I mean, he, he got guys from Oklahoma and small communities that end up being some of the finest players that played at OCU. In 1960, Coach Lemon had three Indian players. Bud Samant of Kiowa was an exceptional point guard who eventually came back to OCU as athletic director. I, I came here because I changed my mind, frankly, about where I wanted to go to school, and, and a lot of it had to do with Fred Diego, who was here. <clears throat> a lot of it had to do with being a little closer to home, uh, all of those kind of things, and, and, you know, in a nutshell, it was it was the uh, best thing that ever happened to me. Next morning at 6 o'clock, the phone rang, his bud. So I go down and pick him up. He said he talked to him, he brought him to school, put him in a room. Next day, he come in and just mad as heck. I said, what's the matter? Why can't I rumor Yago? I said, well, you can. Go down and tell that guy to move out and move in there with him. Is that all I have to do? He said, no. So he moves in with him. And I found out why he did it, because he'd have his Indian tournaments. He'd be in there about 15 Indian boys in there sleeping, hanging out of the rafters. <laughs> they figured it two Indians together. They wouldn't have hurt anybody. They just laid in rich, and under the bed, on the chairs. <laughs> So he'd kind of get after the team, had to get a smoking one time. And Bud said, we got to win tonight. And the guy said, we'll win. So if you put that cigar out, we might beat him. So he was kind of a, kept the team together. He was a leader and a smart kid. He was still stoic in a lot of ways, never said much. But uh, they all liked him. The best game he played, we played Clemson one time had a guy named Choppy Patterson, supposed to be great, but I just watch him. Just right and never bother him. The floor had a dead spot in him. If he had a dead spot, he'd have it and gone. He must have stole, stole that ball off of him 15 times. Max Williams from SMU, had, he turned him into about 12 turnovers. But he was a great defensive person, just shadow you. There were little people, but he just, everywhere he went, he went just, just right on top of you, couldn't let you breathe. Really a good player. I've had some great, uh, uh, great point guards at Kansas. Uh, JoJo White was a great point guard. Played with the Celtics. Darnell Valentine uh, and played in the NBA. Tommy Cavisto. I've had a, a lot of really. You don't have great teams unless you have a great point guard because it all starts. Offense, defense starts with your point guard. 
And I really think that Bud stacked up with any of those point guards. He could have played for me at Kansas, and uh, even in our great teams at Kansas. Uh, the late Fred Yako, also a Kiowa, was described by Lemons as a fireman. Yago was stoic. He never said a word to hardly anybody. He just had a smile. He sat down on that bench about half awake. He was, he was a substitute, what I call a fireman. He and Red Hanson, when things weren't going well with a fi starting five, they'd go in and put the fire out. They'd come in and give us a boost. That's something in basketball you have to have is a boost. But Yago was funny in a way. He, was, he didn't say much, but everything was kind of funny. It was a sad day when I heard that he died. They still talk about Fred Yako today and his, and his hook shot, and it didn't seem to matter where or what hand he could, he could do the hook shot with either left or right. When I was watching Yako for the first time, he didn't start the game, but I was a statistics hound. I kept up with uh, all the averages, and he was, I think, first or second scorer on the team. But he came into the game and it looked as if Samant was looking for him. And Yako would run behind a screen or get open at the top of the key just for a second, and the ball would be delivered just perfectly to him by uh, Samant. And Yako would just jump up and shoot it in the hole and run the other end. He didn't miss much. But he was a gentle giant, you know. He was just a good, good guy. He had some friends, you know, that really liked him here, you know. Iowa Apache Eugene Sudel was known as a great shooter who could score from almost anywhere on the court. I was in the seventh or eighth grade. We had a high school All-American named Eugene Sudel, nicknamed Porky, and he was my hero. And so I went to OCU and watched him play several times. And he was a fabulous shooter, one of the best I ever saw. And uh, in high school, uh, uh, played on a team that was in small school basketball, was ranked first or second. It didn't win the title, but he was a one-man gang. He was deadly, real fast, and uh, he had uh, the outside shot that enabled him to average probably 20, 25 points a game. And if he had played in the era of the three-point shot for the outside uh, scoring. This game footage of a 1960 game against the University of Texas may record the only time in Division I history that there were three American Indians on the court at one time. In 1964, Gary Gray, a Delaware, came to OCU and was the sixth leading scorer in the nation. He later went on to play professionally for the Cincinnati Royals. Well, Gary Gray was, uh, you know, to me, I was a freshman, he was a senior. Uh, he, he barely got across the, the center court and he was firing. I mean, um, I think uh, we were talking about the fact that he had 55 points in a game for OCU and without the three-point line, and that would have probably equated to a heck of a lot of points. But he signed to play professional basketball and, and actually was in Cincinnati when I came up in 67 and played with the Cincinnati Royals. I actually have a picture, I wish I had it out, because it was Gary and um, I think Connie Durking, and we were out at, down at Crosley Field. And uh, I mean, it was really special. I think that, that the, the Reds organization realized that two kids uh, of Indian heritage was actually in Cincinnati playing for their professional teams. The really good players, amazing shooter. Uh, his range was out of sight out there it is so far out sometimes and uh, uh, very athletic and uh, uh, I just think of him as one of the really great uh, ball players and uh, Gray is a tremendous player a great shooter but he played for Cincinnati played well but that's back when they didn't use shooters in the pros or he would have made it they just didn't let him shoot had certain guys that shot Abe saw us shooting baskets with uh, Porky uh, one afternoon, and he kept up with me after that. He watched some of my high school games, and uh, he actually wrote me letters once or twice a year from the time I was uh, eighth or ninth grade. Kiowa Comanche Mike Tosi originally came to OCU to play baseball, but ended up playing basketball as a point guard. I was supposed to play baseball for Coach Hanson, and uh, he came to Bacon 
to talk to uh, some players and um, and he needed a shortstop and um, Coach Hauser and he says I want you to go there he says I try out for the basketball team and um, I, he said I think you can make the team and uh, so I said all right and um, so Coach Hansen comes in and we visit and and I sign a, as a baseball shortstop so I come in and it's like Coach Lemon said I I I'm scared to come here I come here I catch a bus and get as far as Tulsa from Lawrence and then my aunt brings me in and um, I get on campus and she drops me off and then she leaves and here I am two suitcases and, and uh, nowhere you know here I'm on campus so I walk around and come to Fredrickson sit down and coach Lemons walks by and he looks at me and he mentioned and you know, he talked to me a little bit and then he referred me to coach Hansen and then from there I enrolled and I came out and walked on and and then eventually uh, played a little bit, and by the second semester, uh, I got to play quite a bit. Mike's very aggressive. You couldn't ease up. He, he didn't know how to relax and play. Everything was just chew the numbers off his shirt. And, uh, and a very good shooter, and very serious about everything. He had to have a day off once in a while. I'd give him a day off. Had the Indian rule, mm -hmm. where he, when the Indian got a day off, nobody else did because he wasn't an Indian. Mike Tosi was a guy that I always took special pride in because um, we, we went to Apache one night and uh, recruited him and his partner and, and um, to come to Bay Cone and uh, Mike came in. We had a number of All-Staters and, and guys that, uh, from, uh, that had been highly successful in, in high school and Mike came in and, and not only played with them but beat many of them out and uh, was the hardest working kid I ever had. Uh, I was so proud when he went on to OCU and played because it, he, he was the kind that, that came from a small school without much notoriety, made a place for himself, successful, and not only as a player, then went on, it was success in life. George Beatty, a Caddo, was recruited by Lemons in 1973, the year Lemons left OCU for Pan American University. Division one and you know I like that aspect that I got the chance to play Division one as opposed to having to go to junior college or something like that and ride around on a bus and then when he recruited me he told me he was gonna you know I'd make the I was gonna travel and so you know that was another you know uh, that was another reason why I went there you know because schedule was you know we went to a lot of different places. Uh, the jump shot he had was um, he'd get off the floor and, and um, his range was, was probably as, as similar to uh, what I've seen in Gary Gray. George Beatty was sort of like suitable. He came in when we had other players. He had a hard time getting around him and didn't get to play much. He was smart, knew he was going to get out of school, never played as much as he should, but he was a good player. <laughs> Lemon's the guy asked me when I finished coaching, I got 599 wins. He says, how does it feel not to get 600? And I said, how many did Adolph Rupp have? And he said, who? Mm. And I said, you've answered your own question. <laughs> but he did not know. I don't care. When it's over, like Peggy Lee says, is that all there is? During Lemon's early coaching career at OCU, he was able to lead his team to the NCAA tournament or the NIT tournament eight times. This was an astonishing record for one of the smallest Division I schools in the country and was only surpassed by UCLA and Kentucky during the same time period. This despite the fact that in 1973, when he was in his 18th year at OCU, his salary was a meager $14,000. He was a very successful coach. Uh, he took Oklahoma City uh, University to, to so many NCAA tournaments and postseason tournaments. Uh, uh, I mean, his, his record as a coach uh, is something to really be proud of. Uh, I know he, and he continued to do that at Texas. He had very good teams at Texas. Texas and Arkansas used to really battle uh, for the Southwest Conference Championship. As a fan of, of college basketball, I thought Abe was a, a, one of the most uh, uh, talented coaches I, I ever saw. And, and when I say that, he could he could read a team that he an, uh, an opposition and uh, make adjustments on how they need to play them so they could be a competitive even when the other team maybe was uh, had more talented players so he found a way to keep them in the game and give them an opportunity to win the ball game uh, i think he got uh, the most out of his talent uh, 
And, and I always felt like that Abe's players uh, responded well to Abe, and that's why they were so competitive in, in whatever uh, conference they were playing in, because they responded to him and, and that uh, he was able to bring them to that level. A man's life is not necessarily measured by his success in his career or by the wealth he accumulates, but the true measure is seen in the lives of those people that he touched. When you hear ex-players talk so highly of a coach, I think that speaks volumes of his character and, and his integrity. Like I say, the letters that we received from those boys that praised him for everything that he did for them. That was real rewarding. And he loved his, his Indian players. He really did. I owe a lot to him and to that university. And I, don't th I think that those of us who played for him learned so much and uh, had so many experiences. And one thing he liked to do with all us kids from small towns was travel. You know, we went to Seattle and Miami and Honolulu and New York and uh, all these places, and he enjoyed taking us to those places. So I don't think there's a way, really, that we could adequately ever pay him back for his belief in us. But I don't think, in his mind, that we owe him anything. He, if we gave him uh, what we had, while we were at school and on the court, I think he felt that's a fair deal. And he was always positive with us. He was always giving us reason to think that, you know, the goal could be reached and uh, we could do better. And, um, you know, as it turned out, that's true. Uh, and later in life, you know, all of those things that he said and all of the advice he gave us, uh, I think helped, I know it helped me, you know, get through the, the career that I've had. And uh, those are kind of things I think that Lots of times you don't, you don't think about when you're a player. But um, I, I do owe Coach Lemons a, a great deal in regard to uh, my being, uh, I think, successful in many ways. Um, I don't think I said two words to him in two years. Um, well, except that one time we had that conversation. I'll be back. Yeah, I'll be back. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah, I'll be back. And, and uh, but um, he was, um, he was. Um, uh, very important to me and, and even became very important to me later. Um, it's, when, you, when you're young like that, you're 20, 21, you don't know anything. And, and then later, it's like Bud said, you realize what he's trying to do and, and how much he's trying to push you and how much he cares about you. And um, I, I realized how much he cared about me and I realized what he was doing. And um, he made me a better person. You no, know, Abe gave me one of the highest honors that he could possibly give me uh, when he asked me to present him at the induction to the Oklahoma Sports Hall of Fame. And I remember one of the things that I said and was that uh, we probably uh, never will know how much he actually taught us in what he did. I think that's the real legacy of uh, Abe Lemons is look at his players and look at how many of them are in leadership positions, how well they have done, whether they've chosen business or education or some other profession. Those players are just, they're just real credits to that uh, OCU program. And it's not just the players who were stars. The number one thing he was, was a teacher. Uh, and I think he took more pride in being a teacher than a, than a coach. Uh, and I, you, you look at the people who played for him and, and uh, what they did in later life, and uh, you realize he was a great teacher. I, I was very upset when he left Oklahoma City University and went to Pan American. I was not upset at Abe. I was uh, upset at the state of Oklahoma. Uh, the greatest ambassador we had at that time, and possibly, and not possibly, but definitely one of the greatest ambassadors of all time was Abe. Uh, we could not afford to lose Abe out of the state of Oklahoma. You go to California and say, where are you from? I'm from Oklahoma. Uh, do you know that guy named Abe Lemons? You go to New York, you know. Do you know that guy named Abe Lemons? Well, you know, everybody knew about Abe Lemons. Uh, and uh, I, I just thought it was a tragedy that, you know, we let him get away for those short years at Pan American and University of Texas. And I was glad to see him come back. I lost a good friend, as so many people did when they passed away, but we had some great games and great battles uh, when he was at Texas and I was at Arkansas. Uh, and the media built that up to be such a rivalry. 
And uh, even though uh, we competed hard on the court, we remained good friends through the years. Well, you know, I've always thought that, you know, uh, the really great coaches, uh, people make the mistake of, of measuring their success uh, by the number of games they win. And, uh, and I always felt like, and, and Abe's a perfect example of it, that the success is, is how many of the guys come back in later years and to see him or to honor him or to talk to him or get advice from him. I mean, and uh, I mean, they're 40 or 50 years old and they, and they still come back because of, of the great respect they had for, for Abe. And, 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 uh, um, Abe was a coach's coach, someone I had great respect for. And, uh, uh, and I can tell you this, our game really misses him. I'd like to see him in memory for it. First of all, I think that, that he and Betty Jo, his wife, had a absolutely wonderful relationship. But Betty Jo was always there for him. Abe had all the flexibility. Uh, I don't think Abe would have ever been what he is without Betty Jo. And I think Betty Jo was kind of the, is, is a little bit of the unknown hero in, in, in that situation. There are a lot of people become rich and famous and, and um, over the years and uh, but there are very few that really earn the respect and love of everybody who's a, who knows them who's associated with them those are the truly great people and there are very few of those um, Abe Lemons was one of the great ones everything he did was uh, just pure class as far as I was concerned and an awful lot of fun well, I think the, the greatest compliment that any of us can get from an association with anyone, whether it's a teacher, or whether it's a, a father, mother, uh, sister, brother, basketball coach, is that uh, the real connection that comes from it is that your friends. Uh, I think uh, that's what happened with my experience with Coach uh, Lemons, is that in the end, we were friends.